All right, well, if not, uh, why don't we turn to Romans chapter 15 as we get our study underway. Romans chapter 15 to get us going, and then we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll pick up in lesson number eight of our Bible survey. Again, we are, we're, we're going through the Bible. We're getting the, the wisdom out of it, seeing God's plan and purpose that he has for the nation of Israel. And how it, what he's done is he's vested within his nation for them to be great and really uh, fulfill that which he originally gave to Adam as far as the, the monarchy of the earth and subduing the earth and having that dom dominating influence <laughs> upon the whole entire earth. Uh, and that was usurped by the adversary uh, from Adam. And so therefore, as things gone gone along, and we took two lessons, I believe, to look at the establishment of the course of the world that the adversary charted to maintain his usurpation of the earth. And there was kind of those three uh, major events there in, in Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel, Genesis 6 with the flood and the violence and corruption that was taking place regarding the whole entire earth uh, was just a bunch of Cain's, as it were. Uh, and there was that, that wickedness, that great wickedness of violence taking place place and and God had therefore had to judge it uh, with the flood and uh, only saved eight people from that uh, due to Noah and finding grace in, in, the, in the sight of the Lord there and then in Genesis 11 things go bad again as it were and um, and that was the issue of the Tower of Babel and when God scattered what was produced from that we'll see some verses uh, to catch us up regarding that he scattered the nations and idolatry held sway and he therefore he weakened the nations and had them in his uh, uh, dominion in his power and maintaining his uh, that title the prince of the world that that governor over the entire earth and having possession of the the positions of authority that control the the, the world and it coupled with the course of this world and, and he's able to maintain those things and it's in light of that uh, that we get to Genesis 12 and God separates one man, Abram, from that very area, not the exact area, but from that area. Uh, he separates him and it's going to be of him and his, great, uh, his seed. He's going to make a great nation. And it went through all the things that we did so that you would understand this great nation concept. And that's all we're going to be looking at today in, in today's lesson, seeing the fulfillment of what that great nation is what it means, what, what does it involve, what's, uh, what's encapsulated by that term, uh, great nation, and as well as a blessing to others and all those things we're going to begin to look at uh, by just seeing what, what God's going to do when he fulfills his plan and purpose with them out, out there uh, when he establishes kingdom on this earth. But look at Romans 15. This is one verse that Paul, our, our apostle, uh, is going back and, and looking at the issue of what God's plan and purpose is for the earth and, in, and with that Davidic covenant uh, as he's going to the, the, he's going to come and do for Israel that which they can't do for themselves through the mechanical means of becoming one of them becoming the seed of David the seed of Abraham the seed of David and, and being the Messiah the Son of God and through that, he's going to fulfill uh, five mandates of that Davidic covenant. He's going to be their redeemer, their deliverer, their avenger, their king, and their blesser. And, the very, and, and, and that was going to take place in the days of the Messiah. The days of the Messiah is what, what takes place in his first coming and then in, in his second coming. And in his, his first coming, he, he, got, he strips the adversary of that ownership. He doesn't just come and overpower them and take it by that way. He strips them of his ownership first, and then his second habit is when he's going to destroy him. He's going to be that man of war and vanquish his enemies on this earth. And Paul's uh, recounting this. He's recounting, recounting the days of the Messiah, that which was already fulfilled, that was already took, uh, took place. And also, he's taking a look at the future from him uh, in, in Romans here, what's going to take transpire in that kingdom. And he's doing that for, uh, to, to, for us to learn something in our own edification of, of how the Gentiles are going to worship God, the Lord Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords by submitting themselves to the nation of Israel and, 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 and talking about and, and utilizing that in a way to come along and say, well, if, if, if we're not coming along and submitting ourselves to Israel and we're both one, we should be able to do some great things in this dispensation of grace. There's no excuse 
for the body of Christ to be divided. And, and there's no excuse for the, the body of Christ, and, and specifically in the context, he's dealing with weaker and stronger brethren, to, to have these divisions between them. Those things should be able to be handled very easily, especially, and that's why one of the reasons why he's doing this, especially in light of Gentiles submitting themselves to Israel in that day and worshiping the Lord, when that middle wall of partition is up, well, that middle wall of partition is down. And so there's no excuse, as it were, for those things. But look at uh, Romans 15 and verse 8 as he again recounts what Jesus Christ was when he was here on earth and what's going to be fulfilled in that kingdom. Look at verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. Again, notice that past tense issue there. I guess I should read it and pray and get into it. Uh, I can't help but just but teach you on it. Let's just read it and then we'll pray and, and I'll, I'll expound on it a little bit more. Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again praise the Lord all ye Gentiles and laud him all ye people. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles trust. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to, uh, to redeem the time unto your glory. What an honor and privilege to be able to utilize time not for darkness, not for wickedness, not for the flesh, uh, the only way in which we could use time when we were unjustified, but now being justified and being members of the church of the body of Christ and being your sons and daughters, we can utilize time for your honor and glory. And what a, what a, what a wonderful avenue in operation that you have formed as far as a local assembly to, to redeem the time, an uh, environment to, to do that very thing, and that we can do that, especially as we go through this Bible survey and look at what you did in time past and, and what, you, uh, what your plan and purpose is for Israel, the reconciliation of the earth, which we understand we're not a part of. However, there's great things that we can learn back there, as, as you explain here in Romans uh, 15 and the verses preceding this, that w the things written aforetime are written for our learning, and we can learn from them. And, and, and see the grandeur of, of what you are doing, and, or what you were doing, and what you will do with the nation of Israel, uh, and, and reconcile in earth through them. And there's some wonderful features in here so that we can get a good Bible understanding and be able to therefore better rightly divide, and as well as bet, uh, gain an appreciation of who you are and what you've been doing in time. So, Father, I thank you for all these things. I thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, how they died for our sins, was buried and rose again. And if we have faith in that and that alone, today in this dispensation of grace, we can be justified unto eternal life, not, a, not become or a, uh, be a, a fulfiller or assumer of your program with the nation of Israel, but be a member of the church, the body of Christ, the, the entity that you're going to utilize for the reconciliation, not of the earth, but of the heavenly places. Father, what an what a honor and privilege to partake uh, in this dispensation sensation and the reconciliation of the heavenly places and, and profit in the life that now is through our edification to be qualified to do some grand things in the life that is to come and as well as change our lives here on earth and be able to do some things to your honor and glory right now. So we thank you for all these things, the, the riches of your grace to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, if you look here at verse 8, notice how he says, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. He goes back and he starts dealing about what Jesus Christ was. And he was a minister of the circumcision. That middle wall partition was up. There was a, a recognition uh, and, and a separation between the circumcision, the, 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 the ones, the Jews of the, that had the cutting away of the flesh, and those of the uncircumcision, those that didn't have the cutting away of the flesh. And there was a difference there. And Jesus Christ, when he came, he came to minister to the circumcision. What did he minister? What did he do? To confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And the fathers there are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the, and the patriarchs, the 12 patriarchs there uh, that make up the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. There were some promises given to them, one of them being who, what we're looking at right now regarding Abram and the promise given to him in connection with being coming a great nation. And that's what, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking at here. And what that means, especially on the backdrop 
of Genesis 1 through 11, specifically chapters 4 through 11. But then he jumps. He jumps in verse 9, and oftentimes this is a passage, passage to come along and say, that's what God's doing today. Just because the, the mention of Gentiles, uh, they think that this is what God's doing today. And they say, verse 9, and then the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles. What are those next three words? With his people. See, that's, the, that's an issue of that middle wall partition still up. And the, the, the main, that great nation. Folks, there only can be one great nation. And the, the, the whole concept of being great is that you're over every other nation. That's how great you are. That's that domineering influence that the nation of Israel is going to have on the entire earth. And that's what you have here, the Gentiles worshiping with his people. There's a middle wall partition, there's a submission of the Gentiles, and it's, it's, it's in righteousness. However, there's still that distinction. And you should already have learned, and we, we know, because what we've gone through in the Right Division series, is you get before this, look at uh, Romans 11, just to reference it. Romans 11, and look at verse 12. He says, now if the fall of them, he's talking about Israel, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? What's going on today is that, yeah, God's dealing with individual Jews and he's dealing with Gentiles today, but not through a, a Gentile submission to Israel. Israel, rather, has fallen. They've been cast aside, as it were, for a season and for a reason. And, and what God's doing now is on an equal basis. And so the mystery, isn't again, isn't that Gentiles, Gentile salvation and even Gentile salvation by God's grace through faith. That's, all, that's, that's, uh, that's a part of the prophecy. That's what we're going to see. God's program with the nation of Israel is to reconcile the earth back to himself and have an influence over the Gentiles that we see he gave up back here in Genesis 11. That's not the mystery. The mystery isn't Gentile salvation. It's how, in what manner, do the Gentiles get saved? Through Israel or apart from Israel? And it was long told since the beginning of that great, of that, the establishment of the nation of Israel, that Gentiles would be saved through Israel. And what he's going to come along and say in the mystery is that what God's doing today is apart from Israel. Gentile salvation being apart from Israel. And that's why he comes along and says what he says in verse 25 of Romans 11, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. He jumps then and says, hey, God's not done with Israel. There's a receiving. There's a fullness of them. And Gentiles will therefore, again, be dealt with out here uh, through Israel's kingdom being established. And that's what I want to take a look at. That's why I went to uh, Romans 15. Come back there again, and we'll just finish up that passage. Uh, Romans 15, look at verse 11. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah, and again, you have the Gentiles and the people there. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, the, the, the nation of Israel. Uh, the, the involvement, Jesse is the, the father of David, where God establishes the Davidic covenant, and through the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to establish his throne forever. And, and, and the whole idea, the whole issue of sonship and, and adoption there uh, is involved with that. And he says, and shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise. And notice that issue again. And he that shall rise. Well, Israel is in a state of falling. They're not in a risen state right now. Uh, Romans 9 verse 1 uh, and, and, and 1 through 4, they're in a, in a cursed position from Christ. However, out here is what has been long foretold about, and that's what Paul's bringing up. And he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. They will trust in him, but through the nation of Israel, with that middle wall of partition still being up. Well, come with me now again to uh, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, and we got a lot of passages I want to begin to reference, and just kind of survey and go through and examine 
uh, to see what this whole great nation issue is all about. Uh, there's a few things I want to bring up. First of all, what we've looked at already here is we've, we've looked at the creation account just very briefly in, in, in relation to God giving Adam the, the monarchy of the earth and being able to uh, be that, that, that ruler over the entire earth and whom uh, God's going to rule with Adam. He's vested it within Adam. However, it was usurped. And we have these, these three accounts here. And by the time you get to the end of Genesis 11, God gives up the nations. We saw that in uh, Romans 1 there, in Ephesians 4, that the Gentiles give up on God. They don't like to retain God in their knowledge and all these things. And God gives them up, he gives them up, and he gives them over. And, and, that, and, and that's why we have what we have here regarding this, this on the timeline. We have the Gentiles there. And God therefore then establishes Abram. But what you have there in those first three accounts is, it, it, it's, it's Satan's successful plan of evil. And, and he's got some success to what he's been doing as far as usurping dominion and maintaining that dominion over the earth. And again, I, I just bring all this up to review because it's in light of that context. And oftentimes we just go back to Genesis 12 when we're talking about the right division of God's word and, brings up, and bring up Abram uh, uh, through Abram and his seed, it, God's going to establish a great nation. But that's in chapter 12. The verses one, there's chapters 1 through 11 before that. And what God's doing in chapter 12 is on the backdrop of the things that we've took seven lessons to go through. And that's important. And we're going we're gonna to see why it's so important. And what we're going to have here is Abraham uh, and, and the, the, the rest of Genesis. Genesis 12, and he starts to establish the Abrahamic covenant with him. And it goes on all the way to the end of Genesis and, and, and into Exodus is the establishment of his nation and identifying them as such and, and his creation of, him, of them. He's doing the work. Right from the get-go with Abraham and his seed, God waits until Abram's body is dead and, and Sarah's body is dead. They cannot produce seed on their own. He waits until that takes place and then he intervenes and it's going to be a, his nation. His hand is upon it. There would be no nation of Israel unless God intervened and, and quickened their bodies to be able to bring forth uh, Isaac. And a similar thing happens with, with Isaac there. Isaac in, the, in, the, in the Jacob, in, uh, in Esau. And so that's what's taking place. And it's like God's coming along and responding. And, and what he's doing now in Genesis 12 is talking about repossessing what was right, what, what's his what he started to establish as well as the destruction of Satan's plan of evil. And that's where we're at right now. Look again at Genesis 12 and look at verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. You've got to keep a few things in mind when we're, when we're dealing with Abram here. Uh, We've got to keep in mind uh, everything that I mentioned here. Uh, uh, God's original plan and purpose for mankind on the earth to rule and reign with him on this earth. And, and the earth to be the center of the universe, his universe, uh, to where, where he is going to rule not only the earth, but the heavens as well. The earth is going to be his, his, his central location, as it were. And not only that, but a specific place on the earth and a, and a specific dwelling place within that dwelling place. And we'll see that in a, in a, in a specific sanctuary in that place that's in a place. It's a, it's, a, it's a location, a physical, literal, visible location. And, and that's where he's going to do. And he's going to dwell on this earth and rule and reign with men. You've got to remember Satan's usurped dominion of Adam and the, earth, uh, and the earth by his policy of evil. And again, God's purpose and design now to destroy Satan and his policy of evil and repossess the earth. And we, we've been seeing that all along in connection with God's response, his judgments to those three events. Uh, and even right after Satan usurped dominion from Adam and, and, and God curses the ground 
And he and, he's, and, and curses the serpent and, and all these things and the travail of, of, of the woman giving birth and all these things is that he, he, doesn't just, he doesn't say, oh, I'm done utilizing man and my plan and purpose for them. No, but through the woman's seed, I'm still going to utilize man. And even with the flood there, he doesn't just wipe all the people off there. He keeps Noah and his family. And then, and then you have the issue there of what we just, the, the Tower of Babel, and Abram now is coming, and it's going to be through Abraham and his seed. He's not done. And he is going to fulfill his plan and purpose with man on this earth and destroy the satanic plan of evil. Now, there's one more thing I want to, we're going to see as we go through this. Again, God separates or sanctifies Abram unto himself for his useful purpose here. We just read that in verse 1 of Genesis 12. God says, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And you got to keep in mind as we go through, and these are the things we're going to start to get acquainted with, and you need to. If you want any understanding of God's program with Israel, of the Old Testament, you got to understand the land issue. It's vitally important. And we're gonna, we're, we'll take a look at that. That great nation and, and, and making a name, look at verse 2 here. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So he's going to make of him a great nation. In a, in a, uh, he says, and make thy name great. And the last thing, the issue of blessing there. I will bless thee, and not only that will he bless Abram and his seed, but he will utilize Abram to be a blessing. That's part of the greatness concept. Um, I want you to come back with me to Genesis 11. Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 10. Come with me to chapter 10 and look at verse 10. Well, look at verse uh, 9 in connection with Nimrod and becoming a mighty one in the earth. Verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, in the beginning of his what? Kingdom. Kingdom. Was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of the land went forth Asher and, and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kala and a resin between Nineveh and Kala. And uh, the same is a what? great city. And what I want you to see in connection with that is when God takes Abram out of, and separates him from what's taking place here regarding Nimrod and this kingdom and this great city, and he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Abraham, it wasn't like Abram uh, didn't have any idea of what God's going to do with him. He knew exactly what he was going to do with him. And we're going to, we're going to actually begin to take a look at Well, let's look at that right now. Uh, we'll, we'll have time to go through this even more uh, in, in lessons to follow. But come with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham, folks, has some great understanding of what God's doing in the earth and how he's going to utilize him. And we, we learn of this not only uh, back there in Genesis, but the writer of Hebrews also teaches this as well. Look at Hebrews 11 and look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, that's what we just got done reading in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4, into a place which he should, ha uh, should after receive for in what? Inheritance. See, he leaves his inheritance. He leaves his father's house and his kindred. He comes out with nothing, and God's going to give him, therefore, that land. He's going to give him an inheritance. But notice what else is said about in connection with what Abraham uh, perceives and understands about what's going on here in, in the land and the great nation concept. Um, look at, again at verse 8 there. Received for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. See, he understood it was, it was a promised land. He, knew, he, he had an understanding that he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country. 
and what I want you to see in connection with this is especially when we see in Genesis 13, God, God tells them to go up and down the land to and fro, which is that gesture of possession. And every time that he, he's doing that, and he, and he does that, and he's in that land, and, and things like that, is that he, he understands that he's in a strange country. Well, what does he mean by it? What does it mean by that? Verse 10, for he looked for a city. That's what Abraham is looking for. He just came out of a great city concept, a great nation, great kingdom concept with Nimrod. And he came out of that, and God says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And what's involved in that is, is a kingdom, land, it's an inheritance, and he came and he looked for a city. And that looking, that looked issue is an uh, issue of ex expecting something. You read over there, I believe it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, just over on the next page there. Look at verse 13. From henceforth expecting, talked about the Lord Jesus Christ when he was, was buried and he rose again there and he ascended to the Father's right hand. In verse 13 of Hebrews 10, he says, From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. That expecting issue is that same issue there in, in, in Hebrews 11, verse 10, of for he looked for a city. He was expecting that city. He went into that land, and he understood that, that it was a strange country. It wasn't what God, he, God, it, it, was a, it was a promised land. It wasn't what it was designed to be yet. And we understand that from the, the Sabbath issue there, that the, the first Sabbath, with creation, he laid the beams of his chambers, and then he, and then the second Sabbath after the first, he's going to come down, and he's that that kingdom prepared for the foundation of the world was going to come down and and reside right on the beams of those chambers. We'll take a look at all this uh, later on. Well, Abraham also understood some of those things as well, and he was look he for he looked for a city which had foundation. He just came out of that city who whose builder and maker was Nimrod and all the people. He's looking for a city, not that's built by men, but whose builder and maker is God. And those foundations there are permanent foundations. He saw what he was able to do to the Tower of Babel, and his foundations are going to be permanent. And this is all, we're all going to see in connection with the Abrahamic covenant as an everlasting possession in all these things, and dwelling in that land forever. Jump down to verse 13. These all died in faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that sat, say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Look at verse 16. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And he's not saying that heaven's going to be on this earth. That, that, that heavenly, that's a, if I have my grammatical uh, English grammar right. Heavenly is an adverb. It's, it's describing something. It's, it's like heaven on this earth. It's a heavenly country. That's where the whole term gospel, the kingdom of heaven comes from. Uh, uh, his, heaven, his kingdom in heaven, a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly country is going to come down on this earth. Not heaven on earth, but a heavenly country. And so that's what Abram looked for. That's what he was expecting and all the while, while he's going up and down in it, that's what he's looking for. And then he, he realized that it was a promised land. And through the transpiring of the events that took place, Abraham starts to understand that he's not going to live to see that as, as far as his, his, his first life, as it were. But when he's resurrected, he'll be in that. He'll, he'll be in that kingdom. Well, we'll look at that in more detail uh, later on. But again, come with me to Genesis 12. That's, that's one thing that, that Abraham's looking for. And this, this whole issue of the land, the great nation, and, the, and that blessing is the focus of what God's doing with Abram. And the last thing I want to say, say before we go into our references is that there's a transfer of what God originally gave Adam. He's now vesting in 
Abraham. Abram at this time. That's the issue of greatness. The whole issue of Adam being the moniker of the earth. The whole issue of putting him in a garden. We'll eventually take a look at the, the when we take a look at the land, we'll take a look at, at, uh, at a garden. A garden is not just a, the whole issue of, of beauty. And it, it, it is that, but it's also an issue of where a king resides. Where a, a monarch resides. Where he dwells. So like where he comes back to. And he goes out from, and he is blessed of, it's his place of relaxation, his R&R. &R. And there's that greatness issue uh, involved with uh, subduing the earth and having that dominion over the entire earth. And then the special land issue, as well as that blessing. All those things were given to Adam, and now they're given to Abram for, to, to, to get those things back. And, and God vests those things in the nation of Israel. And you start to see that here in Genesis chapter 12. Now again, what I want to do is I want you to see that this greatness issue is again in, contra in the context of God just giving over, giving up the nations. Giving over the nations. And his dominion through now his prophesied and promised and covenanted for great nation with Abram and his seed, that greatness issue is having them in view as well. Folks, you need other nations to be great. You, you, you need other nations to be a blessing to. And, and so the Gentile nations are involved. We just got done, look at, back at chapter uh, 10 again, Genesis 10 and look at verse 5. That there were a multiplicity of, of mankind, and they were divided into their lands and their tongue, and they became Gentiles. Look at verse 5, Genesis 10, verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations, plural. There's a plurality of nations. God's not going to utilize any of them. He's going to take one man from that. And make of that one man in his seed a great nation. And repossess what is originally his, as well as destroy the very thing that usurped it from him. Destroy the satanic plan of evil. And his dominion over the entire earth. And I want to kind of get a scope of that now. I don't really have any notes. I have a little sketch and a whole bunch of verses that we're just going to try to run through. Uh, if not, we'll pick up, we'll pick up next time. Uh, again, this isn't exhaustive. We're not taking a look at every verse uh, regarding this great nation issue. What I, what I want you to see is what God's telling Abram right here. It's not fulfilled until out here. And we're going to be taking a look at passages all through here that come along and describe what God promised Abram out here, back here. It takes place way out here. So this Genesis 12 is alive. God's not doing it today, but it's not yet fulfilled either. Uh, come with me first to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. A lot of things have transpired up until Exodus 19. Abraham and Sarah had a seed. They had Isaac, and Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob had the twelve, and they grew and multiplied and had children, and, and through them the twelve tribes of Israel were established, as it were. Uh, they were in Egypt for, for 400 plus years, and God had told Abram beforehand he was going to deliver them out. Uh, they're going to come out of that. Moses is the leader of that, and God starts bringing them out, and, and he does some wonderful things that eventually we will, we will examine in, in detail. Uh, and then he gets to that point, he gets them across the Red Sea, and instead of making a, just going straight up to that land, where the adversary is, right on God's land, instead of going right up there, he has to educate them about their spiritual fitness, a, a whole host of things. Uh, but in connection with that, and here he's, uh, before Exodus 19, he's already proved them that they, weren't even, they, they were not going to be able to keep his commandments. They couldn't keep one regarding the manna, how much to take and how much not to take, depending on the day. They couldn't keep that one. They weren't going to be able to keep ten, more or less, uh, the 603 more. And so, Exodus 19 here has come along doing it. But I want you to see that he again stresses, 
his plan and purpose for them. Look at Exodus 19 and look at verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob. We're going to see some. Folks, I, don't know, I get excited about this stuff. We're going to see some wonderful things when they, when, when, what God does with the Red Sea there. He does a lot more than just split the Red Sea. We're going to see a passage in Psalm, uh, it's, it's Psalm 68, I think. It talks about how the earth shook. Not just Sinai, not just the land of Canaan, where they're headed. The whole earth shook. And the heavens dropped at his presence. There's a huge event that took place when he brought them out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. Well, that, he, he's rec recounting that here. We're, again, we'll eventually get that. I just bring that up because those things are exciting to me and, and hopefully they're exciting to you. To understand what God was doing back here uh, and get, get a grasp of those things is, is, is truly wonderful uh, to know our God and what he was doing before the dispensation of grace. Again, verse 3, and Moses went up, uh, sorry, verse 4, and ye have seen, he, 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 has, he says, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Notice that, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. They didn't do anything, what I did. And he's getting them, he wants them to perceive something in God. Similar to what Abram perceived in God in connection with Genesis 15 and making of his seed and multiplying his, and his seed as the, as, as the number of the stars. Perceived that God was able to do the impossible, and, but he had to do it for them. They couldn't do it. And, and he comes along and he tells them, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But I want you to see, now, it's, now he, he, he's testing them here, he's proven them, and they, they, they fail at this part of their education, and therefore end up covenanting for something that God originally gave Abram by promise. Now they want to do it by their performance. But nevertheless, within connection with that, the, the role that God has for Israel is still within this. And he says here, um, in verse 5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above who? All people. That's that greatness issue, being above all people, and he says, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a, what? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A separated nation pleasing unto him. And they need to realize that they're not going to be a holy nation by their own performance, that God in his Jehovahness and grace has to do it for them, they have to learn it the hard way. But, but nevertheless, that, that issue still rings true. Come at, in fact, come with me over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter right now. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. What becomes very wonderful when you get to 1 Peter... As God's going to utilize these people, but the, the doctrine is going to be utilized out here in this time. And the great nation concept, the peculiar treasure concept, the, the holy nation and the kingdom of priests concept can now take place because of the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ in Israel's program. And Peter's now going to come along and explain what they couldn't get back here by their performance. And what he had promised beforehand with, with Abram, we're going to be the fulfillers of that. We're that generation. And look what he says here in verse 7, 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which 
be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same has made the head of the corner. And the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, here we go, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, that's what they should have started to been out here when God brought them out of the darkness, out of Egypt, and brought them into marvelous light. They should have learned a lesson that they can't do it on their own. God needs to do it for them, but they failed and thought they could do it on their own, and therefore they don't become, or, or they have an opportunity to become that kingdom of priests and a holy nation and peculiar treasure, but it's going to be now on their own doing, their own performance, and throughout their whole history, you learn, and a lot of them learn, they can't do it by their own performance. God has to do it for them. That's the whole reason why you have the Davidic covenant, God giving the mechanical means by which he's going to get that accomplished through the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the Avenger, the King, and the Blesser. He's going to make them this issue. And through that redemption, the redemption gets it all going. And if you partake of that redemption in Israel's program, you're, you're this. You, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people. And again, that whole issue is the, the above all people to be that great nation. It's going to take place. Uh, come with me to Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy 4, the law is given. They're in the wilderness 40 years. Dudo, the second, the second given in the law. And he, he explains some things regarding that. Uh, Deuteronomy has become an important book in Israel's history, like one that we'll have to examine. Uh, the three, I believe it's three main issues that we really want to get under our belt. Uh, but look at Deuteronomy 4, look at verse 5. It says, Behold, I, ta I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. They're, they're about to go into that land. He says, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the who? Nations. Which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Folks, we understand, we, we take a look at the law and the commandments in connection with justification oftentimes. But the law has a lot more purposes and, and, and roles to it than just the issue of showing the knowledge of sin. We're going to learn some things regarding that law and that kingdom. It's going to proceed out of Israel to the nations, and it's going to be this very th It is this very thing. It's, it's their wisdom and their understanding in the sight of the nation. That's one of the functions the law has. It can't justify anyone, but nevertheless, there's wisdom uh, and understanding in connection with those things. And the nations, as they would do that, now they weren't doing it. They weren't doing it, so they lost their light of the, light of the world and the salt of the earth. Uh, a, uh, privilege that they were supposed to be but nevertheless that's going to take place out here and again I want you to see this issue of greatness in connection with they're in the sight of all nations look at verse 6 there halfway down and they're going to say surely this what great nation is a wise and understanding people for what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them. There's a lot of things that go in that greatness. Not only just the, the, the multitude of numbers of people that they have, but their influence over the nations. What, main reason being because God's so nigh unto them. And the oracles of God are given to those people. The, the law, and it's the wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations. And they're going to say, look how great they are. As the Lord our God, verse 7, is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? And he goes on and he gives them a warning. But again, I just want you to see this greatness issue is that the Gentiles are going to be influenced by this. 
by this great nation through being, God being so nigh unto them uh, and the, 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 the law and what they have as far as that wisdom and understanding and, and, and a whole host of things. Uh, come with me to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. We looked at this a few lessons ago. We'll look at it again just briefly. We won't take a look at the whole psalm here that David uh, gives. I just want to take a look at one verse. Look at First Chronicles 16. First Chronicles 16. And look at verse 30. That's not right. Um, verse 30. I have 37 here, but I want, I want verse 30. This is, again, a psalm of David. David's coming in, and, and he's bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant in, and, and there's singing and dancing going on. And he gives this psalm here. Uh, look at verse 29. He says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. It's in the name Jehovah. I am that I am. I, I, there's an issue of timelessness within his name and an issue of I am, I, I am what you need me to be for you. And there, there's some certain things that he needs to be for them. And, and there's glory due unto his name because of that. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of, his, of holiness. Fear before him what are those next three words? All the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. You have the city and country and kingdom whose builder and maker is God, and, 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 and Abram look for the foundations, and there's permanent foundations. You have the issue when that kingdom's established on those permanent foundations, that, they're, that the rulership of it and the greatness of it is stable and permanent. And, and they're stable. There's not going to be any more moving. We're going to see some things in connection with, uh, you remember Cain's descendants, they were, they were crafty with, with uh, uh, and they made the weapons of warfare. Well, through Israel's great nation, war is going to be stopped. And we'll, we'll see that through a few passages here. Uh, but again, through the nation of Israel, all the earth should fear before him. That's going to take place. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Um, look at Psalm 68. Psalm 68. Psalm 68 is in the second book of the Psalms. There's five books of Psalms. For the five mandates of the Davidic Covenant, you want to learn the Davidic Covenant, you got to learn the Psalms. The first one uh, is primarily focused on the Redeemer and His redemption. The second book is, is deli uh, uh, the Deliverer and His deliverance. The third book is the, the Avenger and his, uh, his uh, Avenging of Israel's cause, and, and so on, as far as King and, uh, and Blesser. And we're in the second book, so we're dealing with the Deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His deliverance. And, you, and, and you'll see it here. Uh, but what's talk, what he's going to talk about is his deliverance, and then the, he's going to talk about the kingdom here. Look at verse 1. Let God arise. We'll remember that in connection with, with what we looked at as far as right division series. Stephen sees him standing. When he's going to arise, he's, start gonna, he's going to commence his, his day of wrath, as it were, and pour out his wrath. And look what he's going to do. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him as smoke is driven away. So drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto, him God, uh, sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. And that's the whole issue you read there in Revelation. Uh, I forget where. Chapter 2 is coming to my head right now. Revelation chapter 2 where Christ comes back as the man of war on the white horse. His white horse. His high horse, as it were, in, in, in righteousness. And he's going to do some things in connection with his enemies. But look what he goes on to do. Um, look at verse... For time's sake, let's look at verse 22. 
He says, And the Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. They have seen thy goings, O God. Well, come, uh, there's some other issues I want to deal with. We just don't have the time to deal with right now. Uh, come down to verse... Look at verse 28. That God hath commanded thy strength, strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. There again you have the Gentile kings bringing presents unto him when his kingdom's established. Gentiles are involved here. Look at verse 30. Remember I talk about that, that, that casting down of war? Rebuke the company of spearmen the multitude of the bulls with the calves of the people till every one submit himself with pieces of silver scatter thou the people that delight in war princes shall come out of Egypt Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God sing unto God ye kingdoms of the earth O sing praises unto the Lord Selah to him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens which are old lo he doth send out his voice and that a mighty voice Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. Now, what I want you to see again is specifically in connection with verse 31. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Kings will bring presents unto you. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon uh, stretch out her hands unto God. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. And guess where God's going to be? Through the Lord Jesus Christ in Israel, in Jerusalem in a specific mountain, in a specific place, in a specific sanctuary. And that's where he's going to rule and reign, but it's over the earth. That's that greatness issue. Let's take a look at one more. Come back with me to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Look at, uh, we'll just read through this. Again, there's, there's more than one thing I want to do in these Psalms. I'm just trying to bring out that greatness issue right now. Look at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. Uh, by the way, this is a psalm. Uh, if you have the, the, the superscription underneath the psalm there, it, it says, To the chief musician for the sons of Korah, sung upon Alamoth. And that's a, uh, that's a song upon Alamoth is an issue of, of handmaidens. And they're going to be singing this psalm. My understanding, this is a unique uh, role that the, the women will have as far as the coronation of that kingdom. They're going to be singing this psalm as the Lord Jesus Christ goes into that kingdom uh, with true Israel there. Uh, when, it, when he comes back and he gathers them there on Mount, uh, uh, Mount, Mount Zion and, he, and then he goes into Jerusalem, uh, they're going to be singing this, this psalm. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will, uh, therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. He's talking about the, the wrath there. Though the waters there, there roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. And there's a, there's a break there. And then in verse 4, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. There's that city concept again. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. And that, that designated title there, the Most High, again, is in connection with being a possessor of heaven and earth. He now possesses the heaven and earth. And he's going to be in the, uh, what is, how does it say there? He's going to be in the, that city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High, and be reigning as the Most High. He's going to get that back, but look what he goes on to do. God is in the midst of her, verse 5. She shall not be moved. There's a stable issue. God shall help her and that right, uh, and that right early. The heathen raged, past tense, because, again, it's going to be dealing with some things, uh, the coronation of the kingdom here. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah, there's another break. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desola desolations he hath made in the earth due to the law contract. Leviticus 26 we'll eventually look at. He maketh wars to cease. 
unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. There's that greatness issue again. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. That's, he's going to be with them here. Emmanuel. God is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Look at verse 10 there again. I will be exalted among the who? Heathen. I will be exalted in the earth as he reigns as that most high God. And through the nation of Israel, being that great nation, the Gentiles are going to come up and, and ascribe glory to him and ascribe greatness. Some are going to be judged, some thrown in the lake of fire. And there's going to be a whole host of things coming. But the general concept there is that they're, they're going to be going unto him, unto that nation. There's going to be highways established for the division of the earth regarding the sons of Adam. And there's 12 tribes because God broke up the earth in 12 territories. And it's going to be like there's six and six that come through the highways, come up to worship Israel. And that's why you need a kingdom of priests to mediate between God and the Gentiles who are coming unto him. That's why you had the priesthood there who mediated between the children of Israel and God. Well, now you have a whole nation. It's a kingdom of priests off doing their duty as a priesthood as the mediators between God, who's their king, king of kings and lord of lords, and the, and the Gentiles coming unto them. And they're going to do, be doing sacrifices, the Gentiles, in, in memorial and remembrance of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on that cross. And it's going to be a schoolmaster unto them regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, just like it was, what, 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 how it functioned back here. It's going to function to the Gentiles out there. Let's look at one more. Look at Psalm 97. Psalm 97. I, got, I have a few more. Well, I got a lot more to go over, but... Let's skip 97. Let's go to 98. You got the, the new song Psalms here. Again, they're going to talk about the glory and the, the, the wonder and the, the marvelous issues taking place out there at that time. Again, all that is starting right here with Abram in, 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 in the backdrop of the satanic plan of evil usurping dominion from, from, from God. And God's going to get this accomplished. Psalm 98, verse 1. will sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. That's the Lord Jesus Christ as that man of war, the Redeemer in his first coming, and that man of war in his second coming. He's going to get the victory for God. And the Lord hath made known his salvation, his righteousness hath, uh, hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. There's going to be a, a testimony that's, go, that's part of the Great Commission that the Lord gives them at the end of the Gospel Council in Acts chapter 1 there. The Gospel Council, when they go, that, that Gospel is going to go out to the nations as a testimony, and an angel is going to come down and give them an everlasting Gospel right before the end, before the day of visitation of the Lord, and they're going to see the salvation of the Lord. They're going to see that kingdom come down. You got all the movies right now, the Avengers between heaven and earth. You got Independence Day, that ship coming down. You have all these different heaven and earth issues coming. And it's all preparing for rebellion against him when he does come. But nevertheless, there's that. He's gonna come, and they're going to see the salvation of Israel. Because he's coming to save Israel. And those that bless Israel. And that's, what, that's what's being dealt with out here. Never thought you could put Avengers in Psalm 98, but you... you I did it. Mark it down. <laughs> Verse 4. Make a joyful no noise in the Lord all the earth. That's what's in view here. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp and with the, uh, with the harp. With the harp and the voice of a psalm. With trumpets and the sound of a cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. And, and, he, and he goes on there. Look at verse 9. Before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with, in, with equity. All I'm trying to show you right now and, and, and give you an appreciation for and be acquainted with is that greatness issue that's going to take place out there. That's God's plan and purpose for the nation of Israel for this earth. He vests 
within them this greatness issue that's going to have influence upon the nations, whether it be for good or bad. That's what he's vested with them, and it's in their, the nation of his creation. And it's Israel is the only nation that's going to be that great nation. And, and we'll get more of an appreciation for that, but that again is starting to be established out here. In fact, Abram understood that. Not only, did he look, not only was he in that land, but he was looking for that, that kingdom. And, and, and he understood that God also had to destroy the satanic plan of evil regarding the Gentiles, regarding what, just they, what he just came out of regarding that kingdom under Nimrod. And so these are things, that, again, that we, we need to be acquainted with. This is just the overarching thing of, of the role and purpose that God has for the nation of Israel. There's a lot of other things we're going to be dealing with, but this... You, you can't go far without God bringing it up again. And he, and he brings up the earth. And the, the, the whole purpose for the earth is for God to rule and reign in. And so when he brings up the nation of Israel in connection with the earth, he'll, 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 he'll bring that up. That, that he'll go back to Abram. And he'll, he'll go back to, to Adam and, and, deal thing, and deal with things as far as what his plan and purpose is to dwell on this earth. And now he vests it. He, he puts it within a nation that he's going to create. We'll take a look at more of this, uh, this next time. But get acquainted with these things. Go through. Uh, we're going to be in Isaiah for quite a few passages. Read through Isaiah uh, throughout the week. And, and, or not even all of it. Half of it. And, and see this. You, I mean, Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. You'll, you'll see it. It's just over and over and over again. He, he explains this. Let's pray to conclude. Father, we thank you for this time again to look at what uh, your plan and purpose is for the nation of Israel and see that it doesn't just have Israel in view. Yes, it, it, it does, but Israel's influence through you reigning in Israel is going to have an effect over the whole entire earth. And therefore, the whole entire earth, the reconciliation of the earth, the Gentiles, is in view when, when you're dealing with Adam as that great nation. And that land there is going to be where you dwell and where your goings go forth from. Your, the, the, your ways. We'll see some passages that the law is going to proceed forth out of Zion to influence the whole entire earth in righteousness. So Father, we thank you for being able to grasp some of these things and understand that's not what you're doing today. You're not ruling through the nation of Israel. You're not ruling through any nation today, but rather you're calling out from the nations a people to form the body of Christ, to reconcile not the earth, but the heavenly places. So Father, we thank you that we can rightly divide these things and get the profit and appreciate what you were doing in time past, what you're doing now, and in the ages to come. And see your wisdom in all of this it becomes vitally important, especially when we get to level two of our edification in Ephesians there, and you want to generate some thoughts in us of how you're going to gather what you've done in the earth through that great nation, your nation, Israel, and gather what you've done with the body of Christ in heaven and earth and gather together in one in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for all these things, and again, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he did for us on that cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen.